This video was brought to you by Ground News. In recent years, there's been growing support within the UK to change the electoral system from first past the post to a proportional representation system. While Labour leadership hasn't endorsed it yet, the Labour membership is becoming increasingly keen on the idea. And if Labour wins the next election, which looks likely, there's at least a non-zero chance of it happening. So in this video, we're going to explain how both systems work, why there's a desire for change, and the likelihood of it ever actually occurring. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start by explaining the two different voting systems. If you're already familiar with this, you might want to skip ahead to the time shown on screen now, where we talk about the odds of it really happening. The UK currently uses a voting system known as First Past the Post, or FPTP. In this system, the country is divided into constituencies or seats, 650 in the case of the UK. In each seat, the candidate with the most votes wins and becomes their Member of Parliament, which means just one MP elected per seat. This is effectively a winner-takes-all system too, and candidates can, and usually do, win with less than 50% of the overall vote. Former British colonies also use a similar voting system to the UK, including the US, Canada, India, and some Caribbean and African states. However, in Europe, the UK stands almost alone. Of the 43 countries most often considered to be part of Europe, 40 use some sort of proportional representation to elect their MPs. The other two are Belarus, an authoritarian state, and France, which does use a winner-takes-all system, but includes a two-round process as well. The other countries broadly use proportional representation, otherwise known as PR, which is an electoral system in which the distribution of seats corresponds to the proportion of total votes cast for that party. Now, there are lots of different types of PR, but most advocates for PR in the UK favour the single transferable vote model, which is already used in local elections in Scotland and Northern Ireland. With STV, constituencies have multiple MPs to represent the diversity of views within their constituency. To make this happen, voters number a list of candidates, with their favourite as number one, their second favourite as number two, and so on and so on. Voters can put numbers next to as many or as few candidates as they like. To get elected, a candidate needs to get a set amount of votes, known as the quota, which is usually calculated as the total number of votes cast divided by the number of available seats in that constituency. Any candidate who has more first preference votes than the quota is then elected, and their excess second preference votes are then redistributed among the other candidates. This process is then repeated with these new second preference votes until every seat is filled. Now, STV is popular in the UK because it maintains the constituency link between MPs and voters that exists under FPTP, while providing voters with more choice and better overall representation, even if it's not perfectly proportional. Conversely, FPTP is becoming increasingly unpopular in the UK for a couple of major reasons. Firstly, FPTP no longer delivers decisive governments, one of the biggest arguments in favour of FPTP used to be that it favours strong majority governments over weaker coalition governments. However, in part thanks to the rise of the SNP, this is no longer true, and two of the last four elections have delivered minority governments. Furthermore, it's not like those majority governments have been particularly stable. Boris Johnson's healthy 80-seat majority, for example, hasn't stopped the Conservatives from descending into a permanent state of chaos. Secondly, voters are increasingly becoming frustrated with what they see as the tyranny of the Conservative majority. The Conservatives have now been in power for 13 years, despite them never winning more than 44% of the vote, and usually less than 40%. And more broadly, there's a sense that voters are generally just bored of the two main parties. A symptom of this might be reflected in the long-term decline of their respective memberships. In the mid-1950s, for example, membership of the Conservative Party stood at around 3 million people, while Labour had around 1 million members. 
By 2015, though, the Conservative Party had around 150,000, while Labour's membership stood at 270,000. And that's not all either. Another major issue with FPTP is safe seats. Essentially, FPTP creates sort of two types of seats. Safe seats, which have a low chance of changing hands, and swing seats, such as the Red Wall, which are more likely to change hands and thus determine elections. Voters in so-called safe seats, which account for a majority of all seats, are getting increasingly fed up of their votes not counting, especially as engagement and interest in politics actually grows. So, with frustration at FPTP only growing, will the UK ever actually change to a system of proportional representation? Well, the Conservatives are unsurprisingly staunchly pro-FPTP, because it wins them nice big majorities. Equally unsurprisingly, most minor parties, including Reform UK, the Lib Dems and Greens, are pro-PR, largely because it will win them more seats. But realistically, none of these parties will ever win an election anyway, especially under FPTP, which means they're unlikely to ever actually be able to change the system which disadvantages them so much. So if change does occur, it will almost definitely come via the Labour Party. Labour is constantly flirting with PR. When it's in opposition and grumpy about how FPTP advantages the Tories, they often make pro-PR noises. But when they start gaining in the polls and an FPTP-generated majority is on the cards, they suddenly quieten down. This is pretty much exactly what happened with Tony Blair, who promised a referendum on electoral reform in his 1997 manifesto never got round to it after FPTP granted him an enormous three-figure majority. After 13 years in opposition, though, the Labour membership has become super pro-PR, keen to avoid another similar stint in opposition in the future. At last year's party conference, for example, Labour members voted heavily in favour of PR, with at least 140 local parties supporting it. Polling finds that 83% of Labour members and 60% of Labour voters are pro-PR, and in Parliament, at least a third of Labour MPs support PR as well. Importantly too, the big unions, Unite and Unison, who were in the past against PR and account for more than half of the union conference votes, are now in favour. Clearly then, electoral reform has gone from a niche to a consensus view within the Labour Party. Unfortunately for Labour's membership, though, despite suggesting that he might support PR in his leadership campaign, Starmer has recently said that it wouldn't be a priority for his government, arguing, not unfairly, that the government would have a whole load of crises on their hands to deal with first. Starmer, however, will also be cautious of the fact that current polling suggests that with FPTP, they're on track to win about 420 seats, or about two-thirds of Parliament, with about 44% of the overall vote. So that might make him like FPTP a little more too. Ultimately then, there's a classic incentive problem here. Given that FPTP is a system that gets the government elected in the first place, any government is going to be incentivized to preserve the system. And whether Labour follows through on electoral reform will ultimately depend on whether Starmer can ignore his membership. That decision, as is so often true in politics, is complex and nuanced. And as such, our goal at TLDR has always been to try and shed some light on these stories so that you can better understand what's going on in the world around you. Unfortunately, though, many news outlets use this complexity and nuance in order to frame a story in a certain way. Which is why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is a very useful website and app which I use every day and lets you compare related articles in one place from thousands of sources around the world and across the political spectrum, with context provided about each and every source of information. Take, for instance, take this story about the health minister's reaction to public sector pay rises. Ground News allows me to see which outlets are reporting on the issue most. In this case, there's no right-leaning outlets talking about it at all. So if you only read from one side of the spectrum, you could be missing out entirely. It's not only that though, Ground also allows me to compare stories by outlet, enabling me to get a fuller picture of what's really happening. And if I want to dive deeper into any of these reports, I can be taking the story in just one tap, with Ground also providing accuracy and bias scores for each outlet you can view. 
Now I have ground news on my phone's home screen and I genuinely can't recommend them enough. So because of this, we've decided to offer a special 30% discount on Ground News' Vantage subscription. A discount you can only get by clicking the link in the description. So check it out and help support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.